Uh, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, I, this has been the meeting that has been the most like anticipated to actually see the ed specs for this <laughs> amazing project. And um, I'm super excited. So I will just, I'll hand the baton uh, right off to you, Kara. So, sure. Okay, ahead. well, thanks everybody. Um, you know, this has been a, a very interesting project uh, that I, I think um, we can all say that has kind of come at a very interesting time <laughs> in Danbury. It's like the perfect storm of things happening right now. Hi, guys. Um, Do you need help to get on? You're okay. <laughs> but certainly um, all good things uh, to come. And so I think, um, you know, when we talk about the project, it's really not just a, a building per se. Um, actually, let me pull up a visual and then we'll we'll go from there. Um, Dr. Sell, can everybody still, uh, can you all see my screen? Did I lose you? Okay, great. No, no good. Sir. Okay. Um, wasn't sure what happened. I kind of lost some audio for a second. Okay. So uh, I think it's um, safe to say that this isn't really a typical building project. Uh, where we're building a school just for enrollment. Um, while that seems to be the driving force in Danbury, and I think will continue to be topic of conversation, um, it certainly presented an opportunity to move forward um, some ideas and some vision that has been um, talk at the table for quite a while now. Um, before we get started, though, I do want to give a shout out uh, now that Melissa Nadeau is on uh, and Dan Donovan, I don't know if he's on here, but um, nights, weekends, before, work after work. Um, that's when this project really has been getting done. Um, during the day we have met on a, on a pretty regularly on Wednesdays to talk uh, with the high school team uh, and a few of the other curriculum administrators to talk about how all of this uh, affects um, everything in the future, you know, graduation requirements, um, uh, programming, the way, just the way that we operate and the, the structures and systems that support teaching and learning. And so we really feel strongly that this is a game changer. Um, it's not just a building, it's a concept. Um, it's, a way of, it's a way of doing school um, moving forward. And we think it's gonna present our kids with a lot of opportunity um, and, and really just better informed uh, students that go off to uh, whatever it is that they're meant to do. Um, and so you have the document in front of you that talks a little bit about sort of the um, the long range plan, the rationale, obviously the enrollment again is part of this. This is a part uh, high school, part middle school um, concept and we can kind of talk about the breakdown. Um, and we talked a little bit about it in the document, the project rationale. And again, beyond enrollment, that this is really about co career connected learning for students um so that they have an understanding and an exploration about what's out there in the world so that they're better informed it's not just about uh the common core math and literacy standards it's about where uh where are the things that i like uh where are my um where are my talents where are fields that i might be interested in how can i explore those uh in a way that's meaningful and in a way that's authentic um, and then provide opportunities so when i graduate high school um, there's some jobs at the other end of the line here and that uh, you, you know what you're working for and you're preparing for. Um, in the ed specs, we did put in um, some of the program goals. I'll actually start with those. I don't want to read everything to you because um, it is in the document. And I was, was thinking about doing a slideshow, but it would really be exactly what's in this <laughs> document. So it would have been a, quite a long slideshow. So I just, uh, I think talking about the program goals a little bit uh, in terms of the academy piece for the high school side, um, I think will be important um, along with kind of going over the, the larger um, the larger vision for not just this location, but the broader scope for the high school side. So the program goals for the Academy of Scientific Innovation and Medicine and Academy of Enterprise and Economics, those are the two names that we decided to house these pathways in the academy at this location. Um, it's really about providing students with choice and rigorous academic pre preparation aligned to the state standards um, and, and really in line with college and career education that bridges uh, secondary and post-secondary opportunities. And that's really key because that is what this is about. Um, in route to that, students have the opportunity to explore career-related interests, understand career trajectories. I always use the CNA as a very concrete example of what that, what that could look like. Um, so for example, uh, students graduate at Danbury High School now with a CNA degree, 
a CNA certificate and a high school degree that prepares them um, for competitive colleges for direct entry nursing programs. It prepares them to have experiences in advance to know if they even want to be in the medical field. It prepares them to go off to the world of work immediately right after high school. It prepares them to have a employment um, during college to help them pay the bills um, and just provides a, a host of opportunities. So they're allowed to, um, kids come out, they're really like a triple th threat. They have opportunities and they can pivot in many directions and they're well prepared um, and they should have a pretty solid foundation for post-secondary post -secondary work. Um, when we talk about some of the, uh, the academy pieces, we're, we're really talking about programs of studies for kids that are different this particular site will talk about health science and then the uh, business career uh, fields and um, the methodology that will engross students in is really about project-based learning and providing experiential opportunities. Um, all of these will be connected to our DPS portion of the graduate. Um, at this particular location, um, there's opportunities for all kinds of industry-related credentials, which are in the document, and opportunities for leadership opportunities, personal growth, um, and, uh, and opportunities to network with, with companies in our, in our local area. So I'm going to zoom out and give you the big picture of the entire system. That's not just about this location. And then I'll zoom back in and I will hop to my document here. And if this is not large enough, just let me know. And if I'm making you dizzy, you could close your eyes for about 15 seconds. Okay. Okay. So what we are proposing, again, outside of the location of the summit, is that we transform our high school into the academies at Denbury High School. Um, and so um, all students have this opportunity. It's not just about the students who get to go over to the matrix site um, into this new shiny building. Um, the goal is to transform teaching and learning at the high school level for all students, and that we provide choices um, along the way for kids to explore and to also to select to concentrate on before they leave Denbury High School. Um, after a lot of conversation, um, some lengthy professional development, very engaging professional development, uh, working with Jay Steele and Connie Mack, they are the founding architects of the Academies of Nashville that we've talked about many times um, in using uh, Department of Labor statistics, um, understanding national uh, career clusters, regional career clusters, and then Connecticut's career clusters. Um, these are the academies and the associated pathways that we have determined um, that will best suit our students and will provide them with the most opportunity uh, in the future. Um, these are not exactly a static, so these should be reviewed yearly with program goals. Um, and they're monitored for viability uh, every year moving forward. So every couple of years, they, we should do a deep dive into um, Department of Labor statistics, opportunities, and what's coming around the bend, preparing kids for the future. So we have six academies, the Academy of Information, Technology, and Cybersecurity, Academy of Professional and Public Service, the Academy of Scientific Innovation and Medicine, the Academy of Global Enterprise and Economics, the Academy of Art, Engineering, Design. I get excited just saying these titles every time. An Academy of Communications and Design. And um, the two academies that we're going to develop out first will be the ones housed at the, uh, at the summit location. And those are the ones that are in bold here. Um, academies, uh, each pathway typically will hold between 120 and 130 students. Um, they can, that can be more or less depending on uh, the pathway, but also some of the interest and demand. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the Academy of Scientific Innovation in Medicine. And uh, starting with the biomedical pathway, you had a chance, opportunity hopefully to read some of the descriptions to understand what that's about. Um, this is a very hot and in-demand field sports and human performance pathway. Um, some of the certifications that kids can get are physical therapy assistance, which is very much in demand, um, but also learn about the body, wellness, and, and human performance. Um, therapeutic health service pathway. So this one here would house the CNA, the EMS, um, and the uh, uh, EKG and phlebotomy. So we have uh, a few pathways housed in this one. This will probably be one of the largest pathways um, in, in, in this particular academy. 
medical technology and engineering. This one we just recently added in to kind of balance some things out, um, especially after having a very engaging conversation with Medtronics, um, with an engineer there who is connecting me with their outreach coordinators. And this is a very big company and they're housed right here in Connecticut. And they were very excited to begin conversations in those areas. And then we have the environmental and renewable energy pathway, which seems a little bit like odd man out uh, in the group, but that's an area that we hope to grow out um, and, and is certainly in demand in terms of renewable energy. So um, we are excited about that. I'm getting another robocall from the Danbury Public Schools. Okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and with that, we also have the Academy of Global Enterprise and Economics. So management and leadership pathway, investment and finance. That's gonna be a really exciting one. Business and entrepreneurship, another exciting and global supply chain and logistics, which is a very fast emerging and developing field. Certainly not new, but with the um, Amazon and, and movement and shipping and sort of the, the disruption that we've had um, with, the, with the pandemic, the amount of uh, logistics uh, that go into what's happening right now is, is incredible. And there's a, there's a lot of work and demand in that area. So these two pathways, I'm sorry, these two academies are, are what we have tagged for uh, the summit site. Um, we think there's opportunity there with uh, not just Nuvans, but with the number of global companies that are located there. And uh, we think we also have, because we have a fairly well-developed business department, already and we have some uh, programming in the health service, it's nice to have sort of a little bit of foundation to take over to that site to begin with. The rest of these pathways will be developing out as we move forward. Um, these kind of demand a little bit less of in terms of equipment and build with the exception of the engineering, which that's for another day. This is really about ed specs for the building. Um, and we can certainly get into more conceptual conversations about this shift and what it means understanding what a ninth grade career in college academy is. Um, it's really an exploration course for this for all ninth graders before they make selections into these academies at the end of ninth grade. So um, I don't wanna make this too much about the, the, you know, everything about the academies and the educational components behind it. Um, we really should have like a workshop on it and get and kind of get down to, you know, details and ask questions and talk about graduation requirements and all those things that kind of will come, come with the shift. Um, this today is really about talking about the site, the building, um, and the project that needs to get submitted to, to the state. Um, in, uh, Glenn, I'm going to be kind of calling on you for in, in about a second, so I'm giving you, giving you your 15-second warning um, that, <laughs> that we'll have some questions. Um, but I also I want to talk a little bit about this piece here in terms of the, the numbers of students that the building will service, which is 1,400. Um, we've tossed around a little bit about, uh, you know, how many students should be on each side. We were informed that um, it'll be 360 students on the, on the middle school side, which is very small, and the, the balance of that would be on the high school side. And so we did go back and make some changes along those lines. Sure, um, can I ask you a question about that? Yes, sir. I, I'm deeply concerned about that. This doesn't seem to address any of our middle school problems. We have more than a 360 student middle school problem now. Yeah. Much less in two or three years when this is open, much less the increased enrollment. Right. How does this address our middle school problem at all? And what are we going to do if we don't address it here? Talk to the state. They've done the, and, and I just ordered another, um, uh, another study for our, from our demographer. There are seats empty uh, at, at uh, West Side, and the only authorization we have for reimbursement, that is, for reimbursement, let's, let's be clear, is that we could bill something about 370, 350, 380 for middle school. They, that, those are what the numbers support. Respectfully, that makes no sense. Well, we were I'm discussing not, a year ago. I'm not saying I agree with that, but I'm saying we, uh, that's where, you asked where, that's where the number comes. We were looking at trying to put in five or 600 there, if you recall, when we were talking about it. But uh, the state uh, in Glen is there now, pushed back and that's maybe, not be permitted for us to do at this point. Maybe we, maybe we need to more aggressively push back against the state because this is ridiculous. A year ago, we sat in sites and facilities discussing it live at Rogers Park 
what we were going to do about a middle school and not wanting to put 300 more students at Broadview or we couldn't do it at West Side or couldn't do it at Rogers Park. We didn't put 300 more kids at Broadview because we already had 300 more kids we had to figure out where to put. This is 360 kids two years from now. <laughs> Maybe we need to push. I, I don't doubt that the state said that. Maybe we need to push back against the state because this seems a little silly, doesn't it? Well, that's sort of with our position. There are a lot of things that are on here, Joe. Um, for example, as we open, uh, you know, the building, just like we do at AIS and those things can change and then we can make adjustments. But the application that Danbury submitted, and I'll let Glenn deal with that a little bit. Maybe that's all they'll support in terms of um, reimbursements. We could build what we want, but the reimbursement's going to just be on, you could put in 1,100 high school kids <laughs> And you could put in, you know, 300 uh, middle, they're fine. But if we if we exceed the middle school number, they have a problem with the reimbursement. So that's why they pushed us to this uh, well, number. Queer, Glenn, can you respond any better than I can? Glenn, are you there? Yes, yes. The um, the the enrollment projections. You're right. I mean, they they take the they take the uh, eight year highest. And uh, I don't have the numbers in, in front of me at the moment, but, um, um, you know, based on what was submitted uh, or what was talked about, that's, that's where, you know, you're right, absolutely right, Dr. Sal, is that uh, the reimbursement is, is what's key here. Anything above that in the eight-year eight projections, Danbury can build it. The, the state just won't pay for it. What do we have to do to explain to the state that the eight-year projections for Danbury are always wrong? that the eight year projection we had going into 2019, 20, not only was it wrong, we were told we were getting 300 new kids. We got 650, we got 65% of the, of the 10 year in, or eight year enrollment increase in the first year, six months after the demographer completed the study. Well, that's why we asked the demographer to do another one. And we're putting in there that, um, you know, very possibly, with the everything being lifted, we may be seeing another surge. I'm putting that in there. If they make some adjustments, then they, then that's to our advantage. But would, right would it help? Would it help us to go to our delegation and attempt to have them speak to the people that do this and say, "Guys, this is dumb. This doesn't solve our current problem, much less our future problem." I, I, I don't. I, I don't know. I'm asking the question. I mean, it's not our fault. We don't know. Mr. It's Chairman, my... may I bring a little sunshine into this conversation? Yeah. Hey, Tony. Sure thing, sure thing Antonio. Um, so um, everybody's getting excited. Over, uh, <laughs> is because, that you barking or is that the dog? Yeah, it's my dogs. <laughs> so um, uh, let, let's just be clear. I want to, because we're among friends here. Uh, let's just be clear about two things. Um, schools are built and expanded based on uh, eight-year projections. Uh, the Board of Education prepares eight-year projections. Um, the projections that were over uh, exceeded were projections that we, as a city, as a Board of Education partners, presented to the state. So um, the state doesn't do the projections. Uh, the Board of Education does. Um, and that's the reason why Sal uh, moved away from the old demographer and actually went with a company that a little more expensive, but they're probably the best in the industry. Their eight-year projection peak for the middle school was only about 300 to 300 kids, 300 to 330 kids. And that's about three to four years out. So that's the maximum that they ever envisioned a growth in the next eight to 10 years. So that is the only thing you can walk to the state with and request an expansion or a building with. You can't, you can't show that you only have 330 kids in your school and go build a school for seven or 800 kids because you're overbuilding, according to them. They're not going to give you state money to deal with that. So let's just be clear about two things. The demographers documented... <laughs> was for 330 kids, and I believe it's Dan line. He probably has it right on the tip of his tongue. I think it was three or four years out from now. So we can't go out and build a facility for 500 children. We'll never be reimbursed. 
uh, the entire project uh, becomes a liability. So uh, that's the reason why we have to fit into the, um, if you will, the parameters of the demographer's projected enrollment increase, which this project does very, very well. So um, when we were talking about expanding some of our existing middle schools, we always looked at expanding our existing middle schools to facilitate about 300 children because there is additional capacity uh, at the uh, west side uh, uh, middle school. I believe it was about 80 children could go in there. So we're even pushing the envelope with 360, but I feel that by the time uh, the audit comes by, we'll have those children in our school system and we could easily justify building a 360 seat addition uh, to our school system to support uh, you know, the enrollment projections. That's the way school building grants works. If every school grant project is justified based on projections uh, that have been done, I've been doing this for 25 years. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, the, the state will not allow you to overbuild schools and facilities when you don't really need them because it's a ton of their money that's going into doing that. So um, Sal I, actually I, has to sign and swear uh, that uh, upon his kids and, and his puppy and his wife that the demographer's work is actually authentic. It has not been modified by anybody in the Board of Education, that it is uh, supported by very good demographer work and that's what he does in the application process that we have to submit, which is coming up uh, in September. So I know that's a I, very- I, Antonio, I, have a, go, go I understand the process. I understand the process, except the problem is the process when applied in practice is always wrong. We do an addition at Park Avenue we're bumping up against the capacity every year. We do an addition at Shelter Rock. We have portables in the parking lot. We do additions at West Side. We have portables at West Side. We build a freshman academy, and it is almost probably too small the day we open it. It's always wrong. So the question becomes is, is this not the time to go back to the state and explain to them, guys, our eight-year projection, we keep beating it. We keep exceeding it. Maybe we need to adjust for that, A. B. And I don't know anything about demography. Believe me, I stayed as far away from math and science as humanly possible in school. That's why I went to law school. Somebody explained to me how the estimates in this document for the for the Career Academy are guessing nearing 3,500 students now at the high school and 4,000 students at the high school in 24, 25. That's a 500 student delta. And we're only looking at a 360 students in the middle school. Don't they go through the middle school to get to the high school? Or am I off on that? Maybe maybe I'm not thinking about that the right way. No, I mean, I'd, I'd have to spend the entire night to try to explain to you the way these demographers work. But yes, they do. I'll call it buggy on that offline. <laughs> they, uh, you're going to have to buy me dinner for that one. Um, they, <laughs> uh, they do uh, anticipate existing movement within your grades, and they anticipate a number of factors. Now, I am going to tell you this. Danbury is very unique. And, uh, and the state has identified us as a unique uh, a community uh, that uh, some of the trending and some of the specific uh, industry accepted methods for doing demographer work doesn't always pan out for us. And uh, they recognize that. That's the reason why they've given us a little leeway, not a big leeway, but a little leeway to go a little higher on the high school numbers, okay. a little higher on the middle school. So the numbers we're talking to you about have already been, Our leeway. I've already beat them okay. up and I've already pushed them to the limit where they're, they're not going any farther. Uh, but, but it is, Thank you. Uh, and, and, and look, uh, the, the beauty of it is um, some of our growth is just unexplainable. Uh, and, and, and they're, they're intrigued by it, uh, because it, it's, and, and so are the demographers. They, they, they just tend to, uh, to try to figure out where it's coming from, how it's coming and how do you model it? These demographers all sit back and say, how do we model what's going on in Danbury? This unique community 
Uh, how do we model it, you know? And they can't. So I, here's what we have. We have a nice fluff, uh, fluff factor in the demographer's work. I've already pushed the state to give us some courtesy on those numbers. We got to just keep our fingers crossed that we're gonna we're not gonna exceed these projections because, Joe, one of the worst things for me to do is go through building like I did three three schools, put three additions on. <laughs> By the time I get done closing the paperwork with the state, we're completely over capacity. You have no idea how crazy. I know. Uh, but the only way we can justify the reimbursement is we have to use the demographer's work. The firm that Sal is okay. using is the best in the state. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just had a suggestion from Melissa Nadeau that maybe we should make a demographer pathway to put the <laughs> <laughs> I want nothing to do with that. <laughs> to prepare for the local demand. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So, and, and Joe, to, just to your point, like, I think we all initially thought too, this would, be, you know, that we were thinking like 600, 800, right? That's so, what I was thinking. I, 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 we totally understand that it's, uh, you know, we are, to Antonio's point, up against a different, you know, a different dynamic there in terms of how they, how they do things versus, you know, maybe what our perceived need is, I guess. So. Um, okay, I think um, what might be best to do is, uh, Glenn, I'm going to just kind of move to where the uh, pathway labs are to start there, because those are kind of the specialized areas that I think are interesting. Talk about the, the, the two specialized areas, um, and then I'll let Glenn kind of take over talking about maybe the blocking and the square foot and square footage and all how all that stuff works. So I'm just going to scoot to um, what appears to be page 12 on this document. Um, okay, so a lot of the work, you know, came around when we were talking about which, you know, which pathways are going to go over here. We had to really do some quick uh, research. Uh, we had a couple of site visits. Uh, everybody was doing homework, trying to understand, what, you know, what what is the best equipment and what is the best build for these types of rooms to support uh, teaching and learning in, in a particular pathway. So there's a couple of specialized rooms here. Um, so the bio, we have a couple of labs. So the biomedical pathway has its own lab, 24 kids, make sure there's sinks. Um, animatage um, tables are, if you don't know what they are, please Google that, look them up, you'll be blown away. But our kids will be working with these, um, this uh, very incredible equipment and it is very state of the art. And hopefully that gets uh, passed in the, in the package. Um, a human and a sports and human performance lab. So think about almost like a physical therapy room where kids or uh, students are learning about um, the human body and performance and some rehabilitation and, um, and wellness and all things related to sort of the physical therapy route. Um, therapeutic health service pathway. Again, this was your CNA, EMS, EKG, and phlebotomies pathway. Uh, again, another animatage table will be included in that hopefully. Um, and that this would be a, a very clinical looking setting, very similar to a hospital looking setting. Um, I have some pictures and some ideas that we uh, shared with, with our architect friends here who helped us out just to give some visuals as we were kind of talking through um, some things. EMT pathway, this is exciting. Um, when Glenn gets, Glenn, uh, Glenn, do you wanna talk about this? Cause this is a great you're, you're doing a great job going through this okay 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 so at the on the ground floor on the ground floor there'll literally be an ambulance bay where you can pull an ambulance bus in um there's also some simulation equipment so it, it is a classroom slash um you know um <laughs> i'm not sure what the word is but literally drive up drive in and you can train right in that room um, and sort of a combination a combination area. So um, I have a you know I have a couple of pictures too I can show you at the end. But again, real life simulation equipment um, and things that students do. We saw this in in Nashville um, in some of the you know one of the schools there actually was in one of their, their their marketing videos. It was an ambulance bus in the classroom, and all the equipment that the kids were using were as if um, you know they were on scene and they were running protocols, and it was amazing. Um, medical technology and engineering. So this sort of brings the engineering side uh, of things to the pathway. 
Um, and so we'll have uh, a little bit more of a light construction machine shop um, equipment in that room, some, some printing stations for design. And so kids could actually, students could actually design some of, uh, you know, research problems and find solutions, design, and then, and then build and test. Um, in your environmental and renewable energy pathway, this is going to be very exciting. Um, I don't know if you noticed the greenhouse in here. Uh, this is sort of, uh, this is going to be amazing outdoor class space on top of, of the summit. Uh, so a learning and lecture lab there, running water, temperature control, roof garden, aquatic tables, um, really dig into the ecology and the environment up here and do some solar work as well. Um, there'll be some storage areas up there. And then there's, um, these are just general design criteria for all the labs that you've seen. Um, hopefully a chance to take a look at some of the curriculum. Um, the, Melissa, Melissa Nadeau uh, and the group just went to town on really researching and, and writing um, for these sections. So I, I can't thank them enough. This has been, um, you know, and, and we, I literally make phone calls on the weekends and at nights and, and people were, were, were going to town writing on this. So I just want to make sure I, I can't thank the, the group enough, um, Dan Donovan, Missy, uh, they do. So um, I'm gonna scoot down to the other labs. Apologize, this is a, this is a little nonlinear. Um, so for the Academy of Enterprise and Economics, which is more of the business management leadership side, um, those obviously don't need to look like uh, science-y kind of labs, but we wanna make um, really simulation rooms, right? So very corporate looking a little bit. Um, You'll see that we have, uh, you know, large LCD displays, monitors and stations, device charging stations, uh, investment and pathway design. Um, again, computer stations in here as well as an LED dynamic stock ticker, track uh, stock market tracking simulation um, software, and you know we're in the process of re researching a few of those video conferencing capabilities and um, just the, the the room and the environment to to simulate. Um, that experience for kids, but then, you know, also the equipment to actually do real work and to understand that work. Um, business and entrepreneurship, again, some of these are very similar, very business-like um, rooms. The global supply chain and logistics, so that's kind of a combination of the business, but understanding the mechanics behind it um, and the systems that make these things work, and then um, an opportunity to um, build and unman aerial drones and to have sort of the work and design space to do that. Um, and so again, here's the curriculum and the sample courses. Um, there are some. Uh, I think too, there are some, because we had to rewrite it, there is some inconsistency. So if you see something, we'll point it out, but we have to re redo some of these areas. I just want to point that out. That's all, Kara. This, this, the formatting stuff. Yeah. That yep. But that's okay. It's still a draft, like we said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, media centers, capstone choral instrumentation area. So um, this will house a middle school. They will have music programs. We'll also have uh, music programs for the high school students as well. Um, it'll have a pretty nice gym. Um, and there's some of the specifications there that are listed out. Glenn, jump in anytime. Yeah, you're want almost, to, you're almost to where I want to go. Okay. And then uh, beyond the gym, the cafeteria is... Uh, you know, that's one area that I think we still have to do a little more work on. Um, it's a little bit, a little bit small, but, um, and then uh, this other stuff here gets into the main office administrative areas uh, and all the blocking. Do you want me to go down to the blocking or the, or the matrix? To, to the matrix. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So as, as, uh, um, Karen and the team right identified the, the pathways, the types of rooms and so forth. Um, our team uh, looked at each of those uh, kind of spaces and, and based on the uh, uh, needs of, of the pathway labs or um, uh, other types of classrooms, identified uh, the uh, size and capacity of each of those uh, uh, clabs um, you know, throughout the, uh, throughout the program. Um, those are the, obviously the specialty types of, uh, spaces, the classrooms, the, the core classrooms are pretty much what you would think that they would be in, in, uh, you know, uh, Danbury high school or any of the middle schools. Um, 
the key challenge here is obviously we were dealing with or are dealing with an existing building um, and and how does how does uh, each of these spaces might they fit into um, into the program and into into the building so um, you know we we kind of uh, went through that and and uh, based on the square footages identified what could fit in the in the existing um, uh, building uh, space and then what uh, 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 spaces would be built on the ground level um, as new space and um, uh, in order to do that, we did a, a, a blocking diagram and, and a uh, uh, relationship uh, um, diagram so that we could understand how things were stacked um, on all the floors and, uh, um, you know, what that might look like. It's very abstract, you know, to, um, uh, to, to most, uh, but to, to an architect, uh, it's a great planning tool to, to move forward into the next step. This, of course, is a roadmap that would be given to the design architects. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this is going to be a, a great tool for that, you know, next step in the process. Um, so, so go ahead, Glenn. I was going to go ahead. Yeah, no, um, you know, I don't know if you want to just, is the uh, blocking diagram in here? <laughs> we we tried to identify all of the all of the different spaces in the building, um, along with the mechanical and electrical needs of the of the building, um, some of the furniture needs um, as well. And and this is again very abstract, but uh, you know there's there's two two larger wings, and then the center uh, wing that is smaller. So identifying what uh, what kinds of spaces are going into um, each of those wings and the uh, uh, adjacencies of, of the spaces, um, and uh, so I think you know overall it's a, uh, a a great document to get started with the design you know design phase. So for the board, you know, in terms of conceptually. Um, <laughs> It's a remarkable plan, but you know it does change the way we do business. Um, um, you heard Kara allude to graduation requirements in the board's graduation requirements. Uh, we've up to 25 now, so you know um, with the core work that has to be done, we do have the option we call alternative uh, ways of getting credits that we could look at where some courses can apply um, to meet them. But what the board board needs to and we all need to keep in mind, in order for giving all of our youngsters an opportunity to experience these academies and their um, and their particular interest they may have in the pathways they have, um, we that is our band kids, our accelerated kids, or kids that are getting support. Um, we have a seven period day. We probably have to go an eight period day at the high school to give the alternative for youngsters to be able to take core and then come experience this. So, you know, not only are we building a school, um, but we're building an education platform that is distinctly different, that will require different patterns and ways that our kids will matriculate through the curriculum. Um, and there is no, there is no um, leaving youngsters out because listen, I made a choice as a ninth grader or 10th grader, and now I can't get in. There is flexibility uh, in this, but it is not just the building. It's going to drive um, all of the work that we do. I know the board members were at the meeting when Melissa came that night and kind of talked that through. Well, this is this is what's coming. This is what's real. And um, the, you've heard us talk about the academies in Nashville. The people from Nashville have been advisors on this for us. Uh, giving us uh, the do's and the don'ts and um, the industry standards and ways to go about the business. And this team here in Danbury focused on equity and access for all kids. And with that, uh, the design does permit that. Uh, it permits a youngster to, to enter into ninth grade, uh, have some exploratory courses, and then make some choices as to what they would like to do um, along with their core. So. Uh, it, it's not a, um, you know, once I make a decision, I'm out kind of a thing. So that's really exciting. I don't know, Kara or Melissa, 
Do you want to speak to any of that? Lindu? Is Melissa with us? Yes, I'm here. Um, Hi, Melissa. Rarely am I given chances to speak because I'm so passionate about um, who well, we all know that, so we're, we're holding on to our seats. Very good. Um, yeah, I mean, as, as Dr. Sale alluded to, you know, we're, we're talking about an enhancement to a high school curricular experience, an enhancement that allows students to see their, not only their place in high school, but also where they can go after high school. Um, there's, there's always discussion about um, college and that discussion doesn't go away. But what we do start discussing with students is when you go to college, you're going to college to pursue a career. And that decision is just as important as the college you're going to choose to go to. So it is our intention with the curricular experiences we are going to build out in all of these pathways. And I hope you do get a chance to read through the suggested courses that we can create. Um, it's intentional so that students can experience what it is they see themselves doing in the future. And it's through these curricular experiences that they're going to be able to make better decisions for themselves as they enter a post-secondary world, whether that includes college or not, um, whether it includes um, military or not, um, the focus of their studies are going to better prepare them to make the decisions that they need to make um, upon leaving um, their compulsory uh, school education. Thank you, Melissa. So just to throw a few, uh, you know, we were, when we were trying to, you know, looking for rooms and thinking about inspiration, you know, we started to um, come across simulation rooms that were just very exciting um, for students that had combinations of um, clinical areas as well as student desks and meeting areas where a, 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 a teacher could see students who were working, but also um, at desks with, uh, there's, with other students collaborating. Um, we talked a lot about, um, you know, making experiences as authentic as possible. So when you offer a course, right, that we tried to go all the way, we, we looked at uh, equipment that other places have had uh, installed in some of their uh, similar type pathways where, um, so instead of pulling in the actual ambulance bus, this is a simulation um, area to, to train students. Um, some of the, again, just inspiration for, for workspaces and design. Um, we didn't talk a lot about the middle school side of things, but um, we'll be focusing very much on the design thinking process and, uh, and, and ways to innovate. And, um, you know, when we all participated in the board workshop with the future design folks, they took us through a design thinking process. They pushed our thinking to start with the problem that we're trying to solve and we started to understand everyone's perspective in that problem so that when we designed a solution, um, there was empathy built into that solution. We, we reached a better place. There was a connection to, to the people we were trying to solve the problem for and that, that enhances communication and understanding and, uh, and deepens thinking really. So um, the middle school side will really focus in on that design thinking process, but we will have uh, design um, labs and uh, maker spaces for kids to explore and to dive deep into um, their ideation and, and ways to um, think about their learning in ways that they haven't done before. So, um, you know, these are just inspirational concepts that we've been tossing around just to give you an idea of what kinds of things are on our minds when we, when we envision um, sort of the next wave of classrooms. Um, and, and kids actually, you know, getting their hands dirty and, and working and doing the work um, and learning through very authentic experiences in uh, areas that actually have jobs uh, at the end of that road. So um, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit. I'll take my screen share off for a bit and see if anybody has any questions. Only that I think the board always knew that th this was not gonna be a separate diploma in high school. This was part of just as ACE has been for years, traditionally a, a Danbury secondary school, high school with a Danbury high school diploma, the same as would happen here. Mm -hmm. uh, the youngsters will not have a, a football program, a basketball program there. They will when they go back to the main school, which means we provide transportation. Um, but you know, it's uh, all of that uh, will take place um, at um, the main campus, if you would. So. 
structurally, this is Danbury West in a lot of ways, um, where uh, the youngsters would be there um, and then return to the high school if they wish for other activities. Um, you won't have the same gyms and you won't have the same fields. There'll be, and that's what I think Kara was talking about. We got to look at our graduation requirements and in the requirements, it talks about um, alternative ways to achieve that. And they could build that plan to achieve those very um, um, accredited courses they need, but maybe in a different pathway. So all of that happens. So just to be clear, Kara, um, the way this works, I think when we, when the advice we had from um, when we went to the academies is that um, the, our kids would have their experience in ninth grade. Would you talk a little bit about that? Because I think everybody should hear that. Sure. So all students would come up to Danbury High School for their ninth grade course. So they're oriented to Danbury High School. And over the course of that year, through an ex college and career exploration course, they are oriented to all of the academies and all of the pathways. And so that they would understand um, the career trajectory, if you will, of where certain areas um, uh, you know, the different stopping points uh, along, along a continuum of career paths um, that lead to different things and provide different opportunities. You talk about salary, there's a little bit of financial literacy embedded in that course as well. So they understand these types of jobs produce these types of incomes, but here are also the conditions for these jobs and the type of work that you would do and understanding your needs and wants um, as a person and work, what might be a good fit um, coaching students along the way to uh, not just learn about the careers, but also have some opportunities to kind of get their get their feet wet a little bit, um, doing some site visits, um, having a career fair, which is a very big part of this. So um, folks from all over come in uh, and we you know start to build those partnerships to get kids to uh, people to come in to talk to our kids, um, so that by the time um, that they uh, reach the end of ninth grade. So obviously they're taking all their core courses, but this is a specialty designed course for ninth graders. Um, and so, and we talk about workplace, uh, work-based learning and, and, and how, to, how, to, um, how to navigate that environment. Um, but so, so the students would select at the end of that year after learning about multiple areas um, and visiting all of those sites, all of those academies, um, what would be best um, suited for them. So they get to make that selection and then they apply based on a lottery. The lottery is an open lottery. Um, students put their maybe first couple of choices down and we would work out a system to do that as equitably as possible. Um, the plan is to support all special education students and students who need ESL services in, in all academies, no matter where they are. Um, part, part of the way to do that is to make sure that we're on an eight period day so that students have opportunity to take both their uh, language services and any special education IEP driven needs that they have in addition to these electives that, that um, will enable students to uh, reach certification or at least be exposed to several courses in a, in a concentrated area for them to get a real deep dive of an exposure um, to areas of interest. So um, that'll be part of sort of the action planning that we'll have to do is to get to um, you know a scheduling system that allows for us to do that. We do have some professional development lined up for, for this summer that the high school team will engage in as well as the curriculum administrators. And that is to uh, learn how to schedule these uh, best practice around these schedules. We'll be working with the folks again from academies in Nashville. And then later in the summer, we'll be doing more program at programmatic development. Um, we really had to jumpstart that internally with, and that's uh, reflected in the document that you see here today and thinking through the courses that students would take and the pathways, the trajectories of those courses. Um, we have a lot of work to do with the on roads and off ramps of, of coming into these pathways. And what, what do you do if a student wants to change their mind? And um, you know, how do we create enough flexibility within our graduation requirements so that um, students will uh, can make a change uh, without losing ground in, in their graduation. So. You know, we have a, a tremendous amount of work ahead of us. Um, we have started to put together a four to five year action plan on how to get us there. Um, there's pedagogical shifts that are involved in this that are that go beyond just uh, naming something an academy or pathway, um, really having teachers understand what project-based learning is about, um, interdisciplinary uh, teaching, things that teachers have been um, asking for for quite a while now. You know, when Common Core came out um, and the standards kind of drove us into 
um, silos, if you will, of teaching the English standards and the science standards and the math standards. And uh, kids learn best when those are inter intertwined and that they're able to apply those in real life situations. So um, we'll be looking to do some training in that area um, along with teaming and um, really bolstering up activities and partnerships. That's just a whole nother whole nother meeting, you know, exploring partnerships with our, with local communities. We've started conversations with some area businesses. I had a meeting with Nuvance. Uh, I just left elated because the group was so excited to hear that this was coming and, you know, they wanted me to present to their, um, their board soon and to, to get those conversations started because they have a real need for some of the things that we've identified here locally. Um, and so it could be a mutually beneficial uh, relationship with- um, I think too, uh, Carrie, the state's picked up on this work you guys are doing and are, are coming yeah. in, right? You wanna talk about that? Uh, yeah, so, you know, the positioning on this has been, you know, interesting in the sense that, um, and I have a meeting coming up uh, that I've scheduled because I, there's a lot of dots that need to get connected in the state. In the state. There's a lot of different departments at, uh, at, up at the State Department that have seeds of all of this um, that they're kind of working on, right? These increased graduation flexibilities. Um, Governor Lamont has put out a, a, a doctrine on, uh, on increasing manufacturing, high-tech, high-skilled manufacturing, which of course doesn't look like it used to. You know, it's, it's, it's computer, everything's computer-based, right? This is not, these are not dirty manufacturing floors and they're looking for laborers. They're looking for really high-tech uh, people to help to um, innovate in, in, in through these manufacturing centers, and we just don't have enough skilled labor. So, um, you know, Governor Lamont has some some skin in the game with trying to increase that workforce, and um, you know they brought in some some groups to help spark some things. And then there's then there's a, just a few other groups at the State Department that are all sort of working on this. And I, I'd love to see us uh, string some things together because I think the state will start to move in this direction. We could be if if we do this well, we could be a flagship in the Northeast. There's no doubt in my mind. Um, you know, this is doing a wall-to-wall -wall academy model is a game changer. Um, and I, I, it's not just a game changer for the kids, but it could be a game changer for the community. The community has needs. Um, everyone, you know, what businesses come where there's skilled labor and when there's no skilled labor and it becomes too, too expensive to outsource, they move to where those locations are. And so we have an opportunity to, to fill both both needs um, here, and um, you know, there's a lot of development on the partnership side and, and the and the community side that that we can do. But there's a lot of people that are already interested and are very excited. So, so, so you know, also as you can hear Melissa talk about this, who's a, you know, she's in the sciences. You have teachers that have been teaching for years, and now this is in their real house, and you have a whole new excitement on their part too to select some, and I think the board and the district's gonna just realize the impact, not only for our kids, but the the, the enthusiasm from our staff. Mm -hmm. um, it, just, it, just, it just sends a thrill down my spine to think that, that we have an opportunity to do this, just growing out of a building. So Melissa and Kara and Dan and that team, God, it, it, I think it's just gonna be wonderful all the way around, all the way around, so. I don't know, uh, why don't we just keep quiet? Maybe I'm sure the board has questions. Yeah, I'll open it up, Amy, go ahead. Well, I'm as excited as you are. It's very exciting, but I, I have a few, well, I'll start with just one question and that's, you just said, Kara, that ninth graders will all be oriented, oriented towards all the pathways. And then there's the lottery and a hundred, uh, did you say how many get in? A thousand. Uh, how many? No. So there's, not, so there's so so there's about right now each pathway we're anticipating ballpark about 130 kids in each pathway, not academy. So each of those right. Gotcha. Pathways. So what happens to those ninth graders uh, that you know were were uh, get exposed to what the pathways were, go for the lottery, and then they don't get in? Sure. Then is it yeah? Is it a standard college prep program like they? You know, yeah. So, so what, what we're talking about, it's a good question. And what we're talking about here are really um, 
uh, strategic electives, a grouping of electives. So where, where, where electives could be, um, you know, kind of randomized, right? Well, first of all, let me back up a little bit and say, um, if you if you didn't know, you, you may have noticed that there's not like a, you know, an arts and theater academy or, or something like that. Um, we, we brought that up. We, t we uh, dabbled in that quite a bit and had a lot of conversation around that. Um, the bottom line with arts and theater and music is that that's for all kids, right? All kids should have opportunities to explore that and to have and elective choices in those areas. When it comes to selecting electives in an area, we're talking about concentration of two or three courses. Um, and, and so there's just really a couple of courses that students would actually take to dig into some of this content. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the real, uh, the academy and the pathway piece, it's really about, um, you know, the field, field trips opportunity, bringing people in the, in the industry in to talk to the kids, to get them excited, um, having um, some connections between the classes in, a, in an academy about what, with what students are doing. So if a student who's interested in, in the healthcare area will have a lot of similar and crossover courses um, in, in an academy for which, you know, if we're talking about the Academy of Scientific Innovation and Medicine, there's one, two, three, there's five different pathways in there um, and, a, and quite a few slots uh, to, to, to work with. So even if you didn't get into your uh, biomedical pathway, there's lots of crossover in the courses between the CNA pathway and the, uh, the EMS pathway um, that, that students can take. And so, you know, not every student will get into every pathway, their number one choice, but if they're in the health academy, they should more than likely, if that's the area that they're interested in, more than likely be able to get into a pathway that, that's within the healthcare realm. Um, you know, and those are things that Amy will continue to work out on the best way to do that. There's going to be more demand in some areas than others. So year over year, we're going to have to reevaluate that. So, you know, right now we have um, kids that want to go. I think uh, Dan said there's like 200 applicants for the CNA program every year. Not everybody gets in. They take 60 students, and and because that's all that we can take. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, the goal here is to increase those similar opportunities as much as we can. Um, and add and add to that. And so certainly as, you know, once we get to a wall to wall academy model and we're, we have systems and structures in place, we can expand and contract some of those, um, like I said, from year to year based on, on need and, and student interest. And then also over a period of multiple years of evaluation say, you know, okay, so do we still want to offer uh, an integrated manufacturing pathway, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes or no, and and why you know what's supporting that decision making process, and that would be based on data and and statistics and and uh, you know local area demand. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I actually had a question, maybe, and forgive me if you already answered this, but just like so, a student that applies for the lottery, right, and doesn't get it for that uh, ninth grade year or wh whenever they they would start the academy. Is it possible that if a vacancy were to open up in their second year of high school or third year of high school for them to re-enter the lottery? Or is there, mm -hmm. is it kind of, are they baked into having right. to do the full amount of time at the academy to have the experience? Yeah, those are, it's a great question. And those are, I mentioned at the beginning that we're, we have a lot of work to do with the on-road. Yeah, no, if it's too on, premature. On ramps and off ramps, right? Yeah. Like, you know, getting in and, and coming out, right? And if I want to make a change, what's that process look like and how do sure. we do that so it's not so disruptive, um, mm -hmm. but but benefits the student. And so those are all like kind of part of the action plan and the, yep. and the, the training that we'll, we'll get into, um, into the nitty gritty as we kind of work out the details. But we've, we've had some preliminary conversations about those and they're all great questions. Those are all things that have to be logistically laid out and clear uh, for, for kids, for parents, for everybody on, on how to do that best. Cool. So, so, Joe, that's one of the things, even at that, if you and I decide to change the courses that we took, um, should also apply to graduation. Mm -hmm. So right, it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't impede them from moving ahead graduation rates. And, um, you know, when, what we talked about, those very questions, the, can they make some of the selections? And, and those things need to be answered as, the, as we go through. Because the whole point of this is to, is to have kids focus in that direction. And as a sophomore, 
you know, Jesus, when kids go through college, they change their major three times. So <laughs> I did twice. We could, read twice. Yeah, <laughs> we could reduce that. Look at that. Look at the hands going out. So doing this would, <laughs> would kind of focus them and yeah, make, make another turn. But, um, you know, those are all things that we can, uh, would have to work out. But, um, but as long it, it doesn't impede, my worry is always it doesn't impede their graduation. May, may I also just quickly add to the the districts that have moved to towards models that are are the academy model. The data actually shows that once kids actually enter an academy, they, they it's rare that they want to move. The percentage of students that want to leave the academy once they're in is very small. And this is from um, research across the nation. Um, part of that is due to um, the, the fact that you're in a small, engaged um, community. You, you actually create community. Um, and once you're there, you feel secure and you feel supported. And, and that's actually what the beauty of the academy model does for very large uh, places like Danbury High School. Um, and, and, and it creates that um, feeling of security. So, so the data on kids wanting to leave once they're in is very small. Um, and, and we have actually thrown around the idea that there may be pathways that we, um, we have developed based on um, local Department Labor of Statistics data that kids might not be interested in right now. And so when we looked at um, some of the pathways that we do have, um, it's okay in the first few years if you had you know, instead of 120 kids per pathway, maybe we do end up with 240 kids in a pathway um, because it, it happens to be popular. And, and that does occur as well. And so, um, and that's like to Kara's point that um, at the end of every year, at the end of every two years, you're evaluating your data on what kids are requesting, what kids are not. Um, and, and that's, you know, the whole beauty of like improvement science when you start looking at the data on why kids are leaving, why, why kids are, are wanting this particular pathway, why they do not want this pathway and making um, decisions again based in um, high demand, high um, economic um, wage um, economy. Um, how do we keep um, innovating our own systems to make sure that what kids do want, as long as it aligns with um, the, the ideals of the academy, um, that they're always continuously being met. And so it really, this is a, this is a model that requires continuous improvement and continuous re, um, reevaluation of our systems to make sure that we're actually providing the services to our students that they deserve. Hey, Joe. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, my question falls somewhere halfway, I think, in between Amy's questions and Joe's questions. I'd like to thank them for give, making me think of this question. Um, if we're doing a wall-to-wall -wall pathway program, and this is just kind of part of Damry High School. How do you do the pathway if you don't physically get into, you don't win the lottery and you don't get into the summit? How are we wall to wall pathway for the kid that may want to do it? And like Amy said, is oriented towards it, but didn't get in, not just to the pathway, but didn't get into the school. So, um, well, we have a slide for this. Well, no. <laughs> well, let me look. Hold on. By the way, I love the I love the program. This sounds amazing. <laughs> let me see. Is this the, okay? Here's one. Um, okay, so disregard all my crazy <laughs> names. Like which version? So that's just my crazy <laughs> naming protocol. Um, this is like version nine thousand and fifty. So this is you know. Um, okay, so so the the goal is you know so students. So the very first academy that that we'll have obviously are these two here because we're going to develop we're going to we're going to work our tails off to get these other ones up and running so that sure. kids have you know a place to you know that everybody has a place to go um and hopefully it's within the areas you know at least within the academy it might be you know so so you know if you look at the academy of global enterprise and economics and you're kind of a business minded kid and you want to you want to do something in that area you're not sure and entrepreneurial and a little bit of the business side any one of these sure. you know, will be a, it will be an exciting option if you don't get the first one the second one is you know there's a lot of crossover there um so but you know the the, the trick here too is you know like i said we have to get these up and running the the amount of uh curriculum writing that has to happen you know between now and then um is unbelievable so you know, and, and it's it's relationships with uh, companies who can help support some of this stuff. It's training for staff. It is making sure that we find teachers with the right certifications or, or finding ways to support them to get those cert certifications, to give them in the right seats for this. And so, you know, the, the bumpy part of this will be that, that we'll have um, in the beginning, you know, not every single one fleshed out in where we want it to be. And so over the course of a couple of years, we'll get there. 
Um, but you know, th there may be high demand for this in the beginning, but then as everything else opens up, um, you know, more, more seats are available. It's kind of like the lottery now where, you know, there's only so many seats and then we, you know, we have to kind of go back to the, to, to the drug room, but we're going to try really hard. And again, this is part of the budgetary process. This is part of that, you know, um, supporting, supporting the, the budget with a model, you know, with, with being able to fund, um, you know, opening up a new site and, and allowing us to continue to develop the, the curriculum and, and resources that we need to kind of, to get this off the ground. No matter what we do, even if you just opened up a plain old high school, 1400 kids, we have, we've got a lot of work to do, right? Like, so I don't know if I asked the question right. Okay. What do we do if there's a kid who's who does this? Or, knows the orientation to these pathways? Is that every Danbury High School student or only the students that win the lottery? Yeah, explain the ninth grade. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so like I said, we're, we're going to try really hard to get all of these pathways. One way or another, there'll be a place for every student to go. Okay, so I don't want you. So every student will, okay. every student. So, so we may have to double up on the on this pathway here, Joe. To get to to get a slot for for all the students, but but we'll get there. So every student comes up to ninth grades, so like 950 freshmen or so, will have their foundational courses, their typical courses. They'll take their PE. We'll try to get some of those uh, core classes out of the way. Um, they'll have their college and career course, and um, at the end of that, they will select um, a couple of these pathways, you know, that they're interested in. And then we will develop a process for okay. the lottery process and students will be notified. And then, so if you're a 10th grader and you get in here, that means that you're taking the bus over to the summit location for your classes. At the end of the day, if you play sports, you're in the theater program after school, you, you take the bus back to the to Denbury High School, you come back to the high school. So is the anticipation that all the freshmen are at the high school in the Career Academies 10, 11, 12? Correct. Okay, I wasn't. I thank you. That actually well, clarified. You know, I kind of yeah, and I kind of glossed over a lot of that piece because I didn't want to. I I was afraid that you know, uh, you know, this is about the, the technical specifications <laughs> of the building and I. When knew, I went, I when knew. I went to the high school, it was 10, 11, 12, so I'm actually used to that. So okay, yep. So same <laughs> idea then. Same idea, and they make okay. just selections. So these are all kind of not quite yeah. upper academies, but 10, 11, 12. That makes a lot more sense. Thank you. Yes. Uh, could I just ask a question? And, and I'm excited about the academy. Uh, I'm excited about all the information that I've heard so far. My only question is, and I think you just sort of maybe cleared up uh, uh, some uh, reservation that I have uh, when it comes to uh, students uh, uh, being selected by the lottery. And uh, so you're saying all freshmen, if it's, if it's a thousand, they're going to have an opportunity to get an opportunity to uh, attend this academy. Am I hearing this right? Yes. And that 950 student or whatever it might be is, uh, will not be put into a lottery until the next step, okay? And the reason I'm bringing this up because, you know, as I go back over the years and uh, I think about AIS and the West Side Magnet School and how the atmosphere uh, mm -hmm. as far as some parents uh, versus other parents, because if my child got in into uh, the magnet school or uh, the uh, West Side Academy, they were a little bit smarter, a little bit brighter than you are. So I think the other students that weren't able to get in are uh, and are on a waiting list. I think some of those comments you sort of need to bear into mind when you're dealing with parents, because I think it's uh, it's very important to some to consider those things. And I know that um, things are going to be based on a lottery system as you can't put a thousand here and a thousand there, but it's, it, it's, it sort of hurts students and parents when that type of conversation is going on between parents about, yeah, my child got in, so maybe yours on a waiting list and it might not never get in. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's a, a very negative uh, yeah. point. That, that I think that we need to consider. Uh, and uh, Gladys, you bring up a very important point. Um, again, conversations, some of the conversations that we've had around this, you know, when, when, when students, um, let me try to put this, I don't know how I'm looking correct, but when students are, you know, when, there, when there's a application to, to uh, AIS, application to 
the middle school, West Side, those, the, those are really very much parent driven, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and sometimes we, some, you know, parents that have a little more uh, um, influence, influence or, or capital, if you will, mm -hmm. to, that understand the system, navigate it a little bit mm -hmm. more vastly mm -hmm. uh, tend to have an advantage, right? And getting those, let's get that application mm -hmm. in. And, um, and so, so, so there's, take that and put that in the parking lot. And that's really kind of a parent driven process. What we want to do here at this ninth grade academy is empower the students to make those decisions for themselves. Okay. And so at this point, it's really less about the parent and it's really more about the student understanding the process, understanding what the options are, having the chance to explore those options and then making an informed decision, um, you know, based on this, the, the curriculum that all students get. And okay. that's, the, that's the game changer. Every student gets the same okay. curriculum and they coached in the same way to make those decisions at the end of the process. Of course, parents will influence uh, some of their choices, but every every student will have that opportunity to, to have that same um, equity, if you will, and understanding what their options are and how to access those options. Thank you. You're welcome. Joe, I can't see if there's other questions. Joe. Does anyone else have any questions? I was on mute there. Um, I guess my, my question is uh, just procedurally, uh, do you want for these ed specs, do you need to take another pass at them or do you want us to act on them tonight and send it to maybe a full board workshop or something like that? Well, let me just, this was just a draft for ideas. Yeah, I, I figured. And that's it. But there is a good question, Joe. There is a process. Antonio, could you kind of explain what, what expected of eventually Joe yes the board has to approve it mm -hmm. that that is a definite but what's the process that you're thinking through Joe, uh, Antonio that's sure. for the application uh, yeah no, no problem uh, 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 so um okay for us to put together the grant application we need the entire board to uh, uh endorse and vote on uh, education uh, this is the draft and it's a great working document um and i think what we would be looking for tonight is uh to to endorsement to continue to further develop this and i'll see you continue uh an evaluation that this uh, preliminary ads will fit within the building footprint um, and that we can make it work. Uh, I think if we were able to get that um, uh, nod from this committee tonight, uh, a subcommittee, that, that would be great. Um, but we, we still have a little bit more work to do. And I just have to tell you, the amount of work that this group has done in a short period of time is really amazing. I, I put these folks on a deadline for a submittal or final expects. And they've been working nights and weekends of getting it done. So, and this ed spec is probably better at this point than most that I've seen in my past career as a final document. So you really, uh, I want to commend the entire team that put, put this together. Uh, and not only that, this is probably one of the most exciting programs I've probably will ever be involved in. This is a trendsetter. This building will be a trendsetter, but this that spec that will be housed in it. Uh, it'll be a first of, of many. So um, uh, I, I think uh, a, a simple endorsement that you like what you see so far and you um, endorse the ed spec and the uh, focus of the ed spec would be great tonight so we can continue to move it forward. Um, as we come to a complete and final ed spec, uh, it'll move very quickly. So I think Dr. Sal and Kara, by presenting these tonight to you and you guys getting a, a good chance to be educated on them is a very critical move to us eventually coming before the full board with a final version and having you vote on it very quickly. Joe, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, Joe. As a matter of procedure, if this is a draft and not the final draft that we're referring to the board, I'm not entirely, I mean, I'm all in favor of this, don't get me wrong. This is not a, a question about the, the document, but if this isn't a final document, how do we how do we vote to approve it to forward it to the board? Because what the board would get wouldn't be the document we're voting on. They'd get a different document. 
uh, just as a matter of procedure, that seems somewhat wonky, or or am I off? Dr. Sal Kara and, and <laughs> Yeah, I, I think tonight's purpose here was th there's a lot of work that's gone in it, but it's a draft. And I think what, what Antonio's saying, guys, are we going in the direction that you're interested in? Oh, for sure. And, and then now we'll take it back. There's we gotta look at this and make some modifications. Tom's gotta look at it and then uh refine that. I don't expect to be much different unless the board said <laughs> not the way to go then we're back to square one but if this then we can make some adjustments and then come back to the um, board and say here's a, here's another here's a recommendation with some final draft for you to consider and then you know like we normally do we look at it the board may input we wait two weeks make any adjustments and then approve it i mean that's how i see it yep okay thanks i, I thought the question too when do you think you have to give the state the final approved specs from the boards by the board? So um, we're working on sort of when that deadline um, should be. Um, remember, the ed spec has to be approved and endorsed by the full board of education uh, prior to us putting an application in. The application is due September 1st. Well, we have a tremendous amount of vetting to do um, to make sure the ed spec can actually be met. Uh, and we're going to be doing that now that we, we have a very good document in front of us to do that. So, Joe, I don't think we're looking for anything that's crazy formal. We just want to make sure that what we're presenting tonight, you guys are interested in. Uh, this very okay. unique, tremendous amount of work document that has been produced uh, is something that you guys are interested in because now I will start to work to make sure that this fits in the building and working with the team that we have, they will ultimately finish up the final document uh, for you guys to approve as a full board. So um, you might not even have to do any type of a motion tonight, but I would love to just hear from you in a sense of a motion that you guys uh, endorse the uh, the, the, the segue into, uh, you know, this uh, academy and where we're heading and the work that the team has done so far. And maybe you look forward to the final document. That's it. That, that works for me. So I have an easy, easy way for us to do that. So let's just go around the five of us and let's uh, give our little our, our thoughts about it. I think this is an amazing project. I think the work that the entire team ha has put on specifically with these ed specs is amazing. I have been excited about this project for was almost two years when it was first uh, the first Nashville um, you know idea was presented to the board and um, I'm really excited to see what it can do because I, I think there is a lot of value in STEM and I think this is going to give an important choice to our students to kind of consider kind of where the whole world is going. So I'm excited and it's got my full support. So I, uh, that's, that's what I got for that. Um, I, I too um, endorse it and um, I'm going to divorce myself from the cost, <laughs> what it's going to cost down the road and just say that it's a wonderful program and the kids will, our kids will just benefit from it tremendously. So I am all for it. I, I, I love the project. I'm hoping my kids are interested in going there when they get that, when they get that far. Uh, we got a few years left to go, but no, I think it's a great idea. And, and definitely pursue, refine this, clean it up, do whatever we have to do. But no, this is definitely the right direction for sure. In total agreement with everyone. Um, I love, I, I was supposed to go to Nashville and couldn't go at the last moment. Um, and I was so excited about it. I'm amazed at what uh, the team has pulled together. And I just love this idea for our kids. Uh, I think it's so, uh, it's so forward thinking. I love that. And I love that we might be a flagship in the Northeast. Um, that would be a wonderful feather in Danbury's cap. And uh, I really, I like that. I think it's a great opportunity for our kids and it's exciting. Thank you. So Amy, maybe I could, we could charge them a toll when they come cold. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Nashville, Nashville has made over eight million dollars. How we pay for it? We need to get a royal. We need to get a royalty or something. Nashville, Nashville has has made over eight million dollars in hosting site visits. So well, there, there you go. go. There that's, you that's, go. that's that's the next that's the next phase of it for us, right? Our next revenue stream. Oh, yep. Yes. Court, court, you can put that in the twenty eight twenty nine budget. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh great thank you and and uh by the way al had al went off to another meeting also i was gonna say if i i thought i was here in the beginning it was he just there's there was a ptli meeting that i think he's attending oh uh, there's plp P, ptli they're presenting some of the budget stuff I yes think. yes okay so I, I guess from that joe I, I assume everybody likes the idea and we're gonna continue um you know refining this working with the city um letting them know what we're doing and and then um you know keep you updated regarding uh, any any modifications that we need that's great and thanks to all of you for all yeah. your help too. yes thanks. yeah phenomenal really yeah. good glenn and uh mike and christina his team you know we i'm not gonna lie i was in a slight bit of a panic because i never wrote a text before so um, you know, he they stepped in and kind of supported us. And they gave us an, an outline to follow. This is what this is what the state asks for, and uh, and you know, they they too were on um, calls with me over the weekend. So I just want to say thank you. <laughs> it happened to be the nicest day of the year so far. So I appreciate your stopping to rake the leaves. Thank you, Joe. Uh, can I yes. just bring up one more thing? I, I, Go ahead. It's not on the agenda, but it's about facilities. Glenn uh, is working with us with this. I've also had Glenn um, work with us regarding next year and the reopening of schools. So, um, you know, we'll be bringing information to you all about that. Um, he was in the district today. We did some visiting. We've done some, um, we have standing committee looking at the reopening with the principals in terms of different scenarios. Um, the state informed me yesterday that um, <laughs> They want to talk to me from David on Monday about our space issues. I'm interested <laughs> to see what they got to say, but uh, I'm <laughs> on Monday regarding that. But uh, all kidding aside, Glenn has been um, really um, with us. He knows our buildings. He's done many additions, and um, so we're right now planning that if um, no matter what the state does, if all of our youngsters come back, what is it going to take to create? Um, uh, person in person learning five days a week, no matter what happens with DL or otherwise. So Glenn uh, is working with us, and so you'll be seeing more of him. I just wanted to, to let you know that and thank him for all of his advice. It has been very beneficial. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Dr. Sal, do you need us to give you a motion that we like the direction of the pathways thing? Do you do you need that for or maybe? No, I don't think don't it would hurt. It. We can do it. Somebody would make that motion. Uh, I met Mr. Chairman, if yeah. I may make a motion. Joe, Joe, go ahead. I'll make a motion that the Sites and Facilities Committee uh, approves of the direction of the draft uh, ed specs that are before us and encourage the administration to pursue them or in and complete complete a final draft for our uh, review in this direction. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Yes, I'll second it. Seconded by Amy. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Motion carries. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Um, motion to adjourn. Right. Yes, motion made by Kathy. Second. Seconded by Joe. All those in favor. Aye. aye.